you not have a million last report on it? No. Well, uh, let's see. Last Offline. weekend, last weekend was we had our meeting in person. Ah, uh, right. Well, <laughs> good morning. Good afternoon, Brian. You've never looked better. That's. There he is. Good morning, Brian. <laughs> Good evening. Good morning. Afternoon, even. Yes, okay. afternoon. Yes. Morning to me, afternoon to you. And I, I saw your little kitty cat there. That was cute. <laughs> Graham has this on the, uh, the tonic cam. It's just <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Uh, Smith. Good morning, Graham. Mr. Cameron, how Sorry, are you, sir? It. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Oh, bollocks. It's Good morning afternoon. for all of us. Oh, don't worry about it. We know what you mean. <laughs> How are you doing today, Peter? Pretty good. I'm still convalescing from uh, surgery from last Monday. Oh, okay. Well, glad you're glad you're home doing better then. Yep, me too. Where, Peter, where are you hail from? Uh, Macon Ware Lodge, uh, 192. Oh, okay. And past yeah. master of uh, A. Douglas Smith Lodge, 1949. Oh, very good. 1949. Wow. No, no, that's oh, the number of the lodge. Oh, 19. I thought you said in 1949. It's like, that's, no, no, no. that's very impressive. That's when the lodge was good. actually founded. Yes, yes. It was, well, no, it was 1949 is the year that A. Douglas Smith was Grand Master. It yes, was indeed. founded in the 60s, 70s, because yes. uh, Virginia Research wasn't founded till 50. So, Peter, you're, you say Macon Lodge, so you're in Virginia? Yes. Okay. It's, it's now uh, Kemper Macon Ware. So it's, That's, that one I'm more familiar with. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the Kemper broke off from Macon Ware um, 30 years ago, and both of the lodges got smaller and smaller, so we went back together again. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, welcome, Brother Friddle. Where are you hail from? You're on mute. Alcona, Lincoln, Michigan. Northern oh. Michigan. Excellent. Okay. Good to have you with us. Uh, okay. Burns Anderson. I read that as Burns and Allen. Uh, Brother Burns. What <laughs> 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 sounds like that? That'd be a treat. Yeah. Well, I hail from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. All oh, right. very good. We have another Canadian. We, we we had a Canadian and he stopped coming. I don't know what happened with um, uh, um, Neely, Brian. Uh, Neely was a regular and then he. Kind of oh, yeah. I, well, I know the name. I don't know the person, but I know the name. It's a oh, yeah. name. Oh. You may have had someone by the name of Robert Lund. Lund. Yes. Yes, he was our guest speaker one time. Yeah, he's. Uh, it was through his uh, email that I, I got connected this morning. Oh, excellent. Well, we appreciate it. It's good to have you with us. Ian. Hello, iPhone 5. So is that five iPhones at once? Are they all calling like as a, they, they have a collective AI? Yeah, they're intelligence a musical group. They're reaching out. Okay. Oh, that it? Yeah. They they were Blue Man Group. Now they're rebranded. No, no. Now it's, it's right. The, the iPhone, iPhone five. The iPhone five. Yes. They they only play music of uh, of uh, bands that have five members. So they started with the doing covers of the Dave Clark Five, and now they do the Backstreet Boys and and. Uh, and in sync and anyone any band with five members they will do covers of them it's very 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 niche um artistry I, we really like that pete gordon patag good to have you with us patag <laughs> hey, hey hey jose good to see you brother and let's see i've tried to say hello to everybody to so come in brother a day always good to see a regular here good to see you all right well this is very good very nice turnout. Always good, good to have more people. We're over 20 now. That is awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Virginia Research Lodge's unstated meeting on uh, March the 4th. Um, this is sponsored by Virginia Research Lodge number 1777 in Highland Springs. My name is Chris Douglas. I am the senior warden and the webmaster and all things related to the intertubes. Um, I'm going to post in the chat. We have the chat windows changed. Okay, Zoom has upgraded the software. I'm not used to their the new look here. Um, 
in the uh, in the chat, you will see our URLs as always. The first one is for our Facebook group. If you're not already a member, please join us. We have the research papers. We have links to the YouTube um, videos from these Zoom meetings. We have announcements of these events and uh, also our research papers. Uh, next is our website, researchlive.org. Please check that out. We have all of our research papers on there. And then next is, it's a different link now for our unstated. I changed it up, but instead I used to give the link directly to the YouTube channel. This is directly to the unstated playlist. So you can watch directly uh, all the previous, all 52 videos we have up there, the last three years of Zooms. And from there, of course, you get to the main YouTube page and look at some other stuff. And then my email, if you're not on Facebook and you want to sign up for the research papers, uh, please email me. But if you're on Facebook, I'd rather use Facebook Messenger. That's easier for me to manage things. Saturday, last Saturday, we met in person in uh, in uh, Richmond, Highland Springs, and we had a good turnout for our speaker there. He spoke about um, esotericism being a uh, double-edged sword, being good and bad for masonry. And that was quite interesting. Sorry. Um, I received a call last night from the Grand Master, uh, Most Worshipful Don Straley. Uh, first time Grand Masters called me personally, so that was a little, um, it was, it was, uh, um, I don't know, it was interesting and uh, a little, uh, a little concerning. <laughs> um, but uh, he wanted me to make it clear that Virginia does not have the Chamber of Reflection. It is not a part of our ritual, and he wanted to caution me. Um, that I don't want to give anyone the impression that it's something that we do here in Virginia. And I explained to him as nicely as I could that what we do here, although Virginia Research Lodge hosts these meetings, uh, we can see we currently have me, we have Pete, and we have John London. I don't see our worship master here. Oh, Michael Joyner's joined us. Great. That's four. Um, we have four people here who are members of the Research Lodge. Okay. We have probably, I guess, about 10 of you, maybe are in Virginia, if that. So we're not, although we're the host and we're happy to be the host, this is not about what's going on in Virginia per se, it's what's going on in masonry and what has gone on in masonry. And so if another jurisdiction has a chamber of reflection and we can talk about what it is and how they use it, how effective it is, but it's not in any way, any kind of endorsement of how we would do things in Virginia. So as I try to explain to him, it's more from a informational standpoint we're not trying to um, change anything dramatically we're just simply talking about the topic but that's the first time anyone showed concern about a topic we're covering so it was interesting so i want to be fair and do what i was asked and i've gave the disclaimer so this is not necessarily how things go in virginia because we're not allowed to have it although the commander in virginia does have it and i did mention to him this is probably the third or fourth meeting where we talk about the chamber of reflection but it's the first one focused specifically on the Chamber of Reflection. But clearly it got his attention. And if the grand officers are noticing our little chat, that's only a good thing. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, um, it, it was very interesting. So I, I've done my official part. So, uh, so we don't, we're not, morning, Michael, how are you? Um, I, I'm good. I'm good. I, Did I unmute? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. So okay. anyway, I, I don't, since we spent half an hour last time talking, I don't want to go too long in this opening part and go to our speaker. So I'm going to go ahead and present our speaker, and we'll have Q&A afterwards. But uh, Brother Schifrin will give him his own introduction and tell us what he wants, what life he's from, as much or as little of his bio as he prefers. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Austin Schifrin. Uh, I have been a Blue Lodge member here in Pennsylvania. Uh, more specifically in the area of Pittsburgh, uh, since 2006. Uh, presently, I'm a past master in uh, Tyrion Lodge number 644. Uh, I'm also uh, a member of uh, Lodge Ad Lutrum number 812, uh, which is one of those uh, traditional observance lodges that you may have heard about uh, following some of the recommendations and guidelines of the Masonic Restoration Foundation. Um, I'm a member, I won't uh, go on ad nauseum, I'm a member of a variety of the appendant bodies, uh, including but not limited to chapter and council, shrine, Scottish Rite, 
Tall Cedars operatives. There's a small chance I'm forgetting something, and I'll apologize to the to the uh, the, the officers of the, that whatever bodies I've missed in advance. Do you? Um, I'm sorry. Let me ask you. Do you have a um, presentation? Do you need to share anything, or is it just going to be you talking? Yeah, like oh, a PowerPoint or anything. Ah, yes, right. Um, I will admit uh, to my chagrin that I had started creating visuals and had not completed them. Okay. And so rather than leave you guys with uh, a half finished set of visuals, it's just going to be me as a talking head. Okay. Uh, I apologize. I hope that I will be capable of intriguing you enough. That's, that's uh, that quite I, right. I just I needed to change a setting if you were going to talk. That's what understood. To. All right. Go ahead. Um, so I guess I will I will throw out a couple of footnotes before I launch into the presentation itself. Um, Chris, I appreciate your pointing out these uh, jurisdictional questions and where the Chamber of Reflection is actually uh, being used or implemented. In Pennsylvania, it is also true that we do not currently use it in Blue Lodge, although also like your jurisdiction, it is used for the uh, Knights Templar degree uh, in York, right? Um, it's being much discussed, uh, but it, it is not currently part of Blue Lodge practice. It is in practice in, in our neighboring state of Ohio. Uh, so I did reach out to a brother, Bob Painter, uh, who is a, a member of a, uh, uh, you know, academic or educational society out there that they call the Royal Schofield Society. Uh, he had done a presentation recently for that group where he talked more about the implementation of it. So uh, if people are more interested in, uh, you know, the, for, forgive this term, the operative uh, uh, issues or logistics about uh implementing a chamber of reflection, I can also put folks in touch with uh, this brother, Bob Painter as well. Uh, what I'm here to talk about today is more about the symbolic uh, and um, iconic aspects of the chamber of reflection. Uh, I will also toss out the caveat that the core of this presentation, if you will, uh, comes from an article I had previously published in our magazine of the Scottish Rite Valley of Pittsburgh, um, it has seen some enhancements since then, which I actually explain in the introduction. So having said all of that, uh-oh, um, my, my dad is attempting to log into the presentation and may need some assistance. So I'll be sidelined for 30 seconds here. That's quite all right. That's right. You mentioned you wanted him to come. He's not a Mason. But we do, we do want to, yeah, right. We do want to try to take care of dad. Yep. And I will say I did have a fellow contact me. I'm not sure that he made it. Um, while you're working on that, I'll, I'll vamp here. Um, Justin, uh, Justin Times expressed an interest in coming in, but I don't think we, I see him in here. But uh, he's, uh, he's uh, this is worth pointing out to everybody that, that we are not restricting this Zoom meeting to Masons because I certainly can't. Uh, check dues cards or, you know, validate um, uh, jurisdictional um, recognition. So basically we offer it to anyone, but it is a Masonic talk. So if you're not a Mason, it may not be much use to you. Or you may not you may have too many questions, but I certainly want to encourage potential, you know, candidates to attend EAs, fellow crafts and the like. So um, that fellow didn't uh, come in, but uh, I just want to make that clear. If you want to invite someone who's not a Mason, they're more than welcome to join us. So whenever you're ready, Austin, just... Uh, All right. Uh, my apologies. I did want to see whether I could uh, spot uh, what my dad was talking about, but I can't. He, he, he says that he emailed me and I cannot find it. Okay. Um, so in the interest of not holding anybody else up... Uh, also, forgive me. Uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll look like I'm uh, looking, gazing off into the distance here, but it's only because I've got the, uh, the text of the presentation up on another monitor. That's fine. Uh, in the year 2019, I experienced the loss of several loved ones, hitting closer and closer to home. It began with a dear Blue Lodge brother and the father of my first line signer, Jay Cohen, who passed away on February 3rd of 2019. Then my aunt, Francine Schifrin, passed away May 6th of 2019. My stepfather, Marvin Sweet, passed away September 1st, 2019. And my grandmother, Gladys Novick, passed on October 13th of 2019. So all of this was top of mind in July of 2020, along with the terrible impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which had subjected us to illness and death unlike we had seen for a century, when I submitted the article, which is at the heart of this presentation. 
on October 27th of 2021, I lost my mother, Miriam Sweet. And on August 7th, 2022, I lost my stepmother, Ellen Schifrin. In addition, the pandemic continues around the world today. And so mortality is still never far from the forefront of my mind, as a result of which I thought of additional material that I believe augments what I had already composed. When I think of my own mortality, my thoughts often wander to the chamber of reflection. The chamber of reflection is a small room containing symbols of mortality, which was once used as a part of Masonic initiation. The candidate was to spend some time there, contemplating these symbols prior to undergoing the ceremony. For as the author Johann Christian Gadecki said, it is only in solitude that we can deeply reflect upon our present or future undertakings. And blackness, darkness, or solitariness is ever a symbol of death. A man who has undertaken a thing after mature reflection seldom turns back. Among the several symbols employed in this room, a human skull is commonly found. Some implications are blatantly obvious, given that this is intended to be an experience of contemplating one's own mortality. I'd like to bring up, however, a personal opinion that there's a right and a wrong way to deploy and appreciate this symbol. It rubs me the wrong way that some Freemasons appear to relish displaying the symbol of the skull because it lends the fraternity an air of danger and menace, more colloquially, badassery. I will not expound on its use in the Knight Templar apron here because of a lack of firsthand knowledge and a wish to comply with the appropriate secrecy. But to see Masons integrate the skull and crossed bones with the square and compass or in other arrangements with seeming disregard for appropriateness or context disappoints me. It strikes me as having more in common with the use of the skull, skull and crossbones, or skeletons in rock and roll imagery. Are we trying to frighten the curious public with mysterious unspoken dangers involved in our initiation? Is it supposed to be part of the dynamic of the teacher of ancient wisdom who takes steps to frighten off seekers as a test of their commitment? It seems important to me that we should remember to metaphorically keep the symbol of the skull pointed at ourselves in the same way that some brothers take a stance that the correct way to wear one's ring is with the square and compass turned inward to remind ourselves to behave as masons rather than showing off to the public. So the skull should be, in my opinion, confined to reminding us of our mortality rather than projecting some menacing implication to others. The skull also features in a lecture by brother Manley P. Hall, 33rd degree, on the subject, the spinal column and the kundalini. Manley P. Hall, for any who are not familiar, was a prominent author and lecturer on esoteric subjects. He first published in 1922 and is well known in our circles for publishing The Lost Keys of Freemasonry in 1923 and The Secret Teachings of All Ages in 1928, even though he was initiated into Freemasonry in 1954. Kundalini is a Sanskrit word that means circular or coiled, and as a variant of yoga, it refers to a practice whereby a type of energy or force dormant at the base of the spine may be stimulated to ascend to different chakras or focal points along the spine, which map to human bodily systems. His interest in this area was very likely influenced by his mother, Louise, a chiropractor and a member of the Rosicrucian Fellowship. In his lecture, Manley P. Hall states that in this mysterious way, this spinal column was a kind of magic wand a rod, a staff by which the body was required or naturally inclined to lean. It was also by that means of which man's upright posture was assured. And it was interesting to recognize that this tall column of bones should support upon its upper end the mystery of the skull. That part of man which seemed to be like a heavenly globe standing up on the height of a column in a strange wilderness of physical tissue and structure. Of this mysterious upper world, we find in the Hindu philosophy that the spinal cord seems to be essentially the Ganges River, which arises in the head of Shiva, arising in the brain in the midst of all those convolutions which are called the caves, where holy men sit in eternal meditation, being symbolical of the brain processes and functions. This river then flows downward like a river of life, and this river becomes a distributor of nerve impulse and nerve instinct to all parts of the body, keeping it alive, so that this spine with its brain above seems to resemble an inverted plant, a kind of bulb with its growth descending from the brain and extending throughout the body. This extension through the body, through an infinite diversity of nerve structure, seems to resemble a beautiful inverted fern-like plant, 
with its root in heaven and its growth descending downward into earth and even into the underworld. While this takes a more spiritual and metaphysical perspective, it dovetails somewhat with the medical practice of chiropractic. Chiropractic treats ailments or malperformance of the body by identifying the nerve branches which lead to and from that organ or system and assessing the spinal column at the point where those nerves run through it to determine whether misalignment of the spine may be affecting the nervous system and therefore the ailing body part or organ. All this is to say that while the inclusion of the skull in the chamber of reflection seems likely to be intended as a reminder of our mortality, a modern man may also perceive in it other references as it is the locus of the brain, that crucial organ from which our cognition and both our willful and autonomic exertions proceed. The skull can also be a signifier of the alchemical principle of putrefaction, corrosion, or decay. This would make the skull a useful echo for added emphasis with other more specifically alchemical references, which we also find in the chamber. One also usually finds a banner that was represented in the invitation to this very presentation with the acronym vitriol, V-I-T-R-I-O-L, representing a Latin phrase, visita interiora terrae rectificandoque in venies occultum lapidem, which translates approximately as visit the interior of the earth and purifying it, you will find the hidden stone. This comes to us by way of the Rosicrucians and the Tabula Smaragdina or Emerald Tablet in case you wish to do some supplementary research. In some implementations of the chamber, one may also see symbols or actual samples of the substances, mercury, sulfur, and salt. These were included because in alchemy, they were considered the tria prima, essential components in the makeup of all things. In the ancient world, alchemy was an attempt to systematize an understanding of the substances composing all matter around us, their nature, and their relationship to each other. It is probably reasonable to state that it was the progenitor of our modern science of chemistry, although carried out with more primitive instrumentation and perhaps a different attitude toward inferring causation. For instance, basing assumptions on interesting symbolic resonances prior to the development of the scientific method. At that time, alchemists believed that all metals were composed of some ratio of mercury and sulfur. If only one were able to adjust the balance of these substances, in a sample of a base metal, one might obtain gold. Or it may all have been intended as a metaphor for working on one's own personal development, as explored by the psychologist Carl Jung in his works Mysterium Conjunctionis, Psychology and Alchemy, Psychology of the Transference, and others. Accompanied by the salt, the three substances were sometimes said to represent air, fire, and earth, or mind, spirit, and body or other significant triads. Ironically, mercury is actually used today in the process of extracting gold in some small scale mining operations. The texts of alchemy describe elaborate processes whereby substances were heated, distilled, or otherwise manipulated in that effort to produce gold, or that symbolic process of working upon the self, depending upon your interpretation. A principal motto referenced in this work, Solve et Coagula, is sometimes glibly translated from the Latin by saying, you need to break down or destroy before you can rebuild. For a more in-depth explanation, I turn to Paracelsus, who was an influential, who was an influ influential intellectual from Switzerland known throughout Europe during the Renaissance. In modern terms, he might have been labeled a scientist, but in his day, he was considered an alchemist, physician, astrologer, and philosopher. In Man and Works, in the chapter Alchemy, Art of Transformation, he wrote, Since ancient times, philosophy has striven to separate the good from the evil and the pure from the impure. This is the same as saying that all things die and that only the soul lives eternal. The soul endures while the body decays. And you may recall that correspondingly, a seed must rot away if it is to bear fruit. But what does it mean to rot? It means only this that the body decays while its essence, the good, the soul, subsists. This should be known about decaying. And once we have understood this, we possess the pearl which contains all the virtues. Decay is the beginning of all birth. It transforms shape and essence, the forces and virtues of nature. 
Just as the decay of all foods in the stomach transforms them and makes them into a pulp, so it happens outside the stomach. Decay is the midwife of very great things. It causes many things to rot, that a noble fruit may be born. For it is the reversal, the death and destruction of the original essence of all natural things. It brings about the birth and rebirth of forms a thousand times improved. And this is the highest mysterium of God, the deepest mystery and miracle that he has revealed to mortal man. Among the other ancient and esoteric symbolism which we might associate with the contemplation of death is the tarot card of the same name. Whether you consider the use of tarot cards to be a mere carnival trick, a useful contemplative exercise, or an important piece of spiritual work, there is no question its symbolism has long, held, has long had a hold on the popular imagination. The death card takes various forms as rendered by different artists. The Tarot of Marseille, which dates back to the 15th century and was quite influential on all Italian and French decks that followed, features a skeletal reaper in a field with a scythe. The Rider Waite deck, created in 1909 by artist Pamela Coleman Smith under the direction of brother Arthur Edward Waite, which is quite popular today, depicts death as a skeleton in black armor astride a white steed, facing down three figures who appear to be pleading with him. If the meager instruction booklet that is supplied with the Rider Waite deck is to be believed, the appearance of the death card in a reading is quite straightforward and means exactly what it says. But as you might have imagined, there are other more subtle treatments available in scholarly output on the subject. Pappus, in his foundational text, The Tarot of the Bohemians, opened his segment on the death card by saying, the ideas expressed by this arcanum are those of destruction preceding or following regeneration. And he goes on to say that the card signifies God the Transformer, the universal transforming principle, destructive and creative. In Israel Regardi's The Golden Dawn, arguably one of the essential texts of all Western esotericism, he has this to say on the subject of the death card. The sign of transmutation and disintegration, the skeleton which alone survives the destructive power of time may be regarded as the foundation on which the structure is built the type which persists through the permutations of time and space, adaptable to the requirements of evolution and yet radically unchanged, the transmuting power of nature working from below upwards. This appears to support a similar perspective to that of alchemy, that although we may balk at death as it means the destruction of what we know, it is a necessary preparatory step for the arrival of something new. Echoing the symbolism of this tarot card, a scythe is sometimes included among the symbolic props in the chamber. The scythe is a farming implement which consists of a long curved blade fastened perpendicular to the end of a long wooden handle, which could itself be straight or have a gentle S-curve in it, and is used to cut down crops such as grasses or grains. The notion of the life of man being like that of grass is expressed in Psalms uh, chapter 103, verses 15 and 16. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. And the notion of destruction being akin to a harvest appears in Revelations, chapter 14, verses 14 through 16. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. I feel that one challenge of the scythe for modern audiences is much like that of many other biblical metaphors. Being rooted in agrarian activities and those of animal husbandry, they can be rather unfamiliar, diminishing the resonance. If we use the metaphor, the Lord is my shepherd, very few of us have any experience with the labor of being a shepherd. Frankly, we recognize the implications more by virtue of context and the way that we've seen it applied historically than we do from any familiarity with the activity being referenced. Similarly, I think that a modern man might look upon a scythe in the chamber of reflection and immediately recognize a reference to the Grim Reaper, 
but possibly overlook some subtler nuances inherent in the metaphor of death as harvest. First, that the harvest is not an aggressive or punitive activity. This representation of death doesn't arrive with a weapon. He arrives with an implement, which is part of the process of gathering that which is valuable, even precious. And second, that the harvest is an activity which takes place at a foreordained time because the season has arrived and the old crops must give way so that new ones may appear in the proper cycle, as we mentioned in our tarot and alchemical considerations. Reflecting on mortality can serve beneficial purposes. One school of thought which promotes this perspective is Stoicism, founded in the early third century uh, BC by Zeno of Citium in Athens. The Stoics believed that the measure of a person's goodness, the condition of their soul, was concerned with wisdom and self-control, using reason to understand the natural order of the world around them. This also required an understanding about which aspects of your life and existence are under your control and which are not. In keeping with this, one motto that they use, that they would use to represent a tenet of their beliefs was the simple phrase, memento mori, remember that you will die. To flesh out the concept somewhat, this was intended to reinforce the value of living with intention as represented by statements from some of the premier proponents of that philosophy. I must die, mustn't I? If at once, then I am dying. If soon, I dine now, as it is time for dinner, and afterwards, when the time comes, I will die. Epictetus. Don't behave as if you are destined to live forever. Death hangs over you. While you live, while it is in your power, be good. Marcus Aurelius. You could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. Also Marcus Aurelius. Let us prepare our minds as if we'd come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books each day. The one who puts the finishing touches on their life each day is never short of time. Seneca. Each of these in one way or another reinforces this perspective. It is a certainty that I must die eventually. Given this, I ought to value whatever time I have available and strive to make it positive and productive. In the words of Ryan Holiday, a contemporary author who considers himself a modern Stoic and has written several books bringing these ideas into the modern discourse, death doesn't make life pointless, but rather purposeful. Albert Einstein, an icon of rational and scientific accomplishment, published a book in 1935, which collected his articles, interviews, letters, and speeches on a wide range of topics, not only the science he was already known for, but philosophy and society as well. In it, he said, how strange is the lot of us mortals. Each of us is here for a brief sojourn. For what purpose, he knows not, though he sometimes thinks he senses it. I must exert myself in order to give in the same measure as I have received and am still receiving. A similar sentiment was expressed in the closing phrase of the winning essay by Chad Svachina of Collins Spring Valley Lodge number 192 in Baldwin, Wisconsin, in the contest run by Robert Johnson, of the Whence Came You podcast. Remember our time together is short and unknown. Please do not squander it. Love your brothers. Death itself figures in several of our Masonic allegories. Of course, I will avoid putting into print or speaking anything which I ought not to. Suffice it to say, if you can think of any of the degree work to which I'm alluding, you might ask yourself, what would you genuinely be, what would you genuinely be willing to lay down your life for? It's one thing to say that you have memorized lessons that convey some moral conclusion, that you know the code or the tenets, but have you, ever have you ever truly tried to picture a scenario where you would be ready to make the ultimate sacrifice? And how confident are you that you know how you would behave? This also brings to mind the pronouncements that was supposedly uttered by Socrates at the conclusion of his trial for corrupting the youth of Athens. The unexamined life is not worth living. We should bear in mind that essentially the means by which he was supposedly corrupting the youth was by teaching his signature method of seeking out the truth by means of using logic and rhetoric. One party would state a presumed truth, and then others would question various propositions that ought to follow from the initial one until the participants had proven or disproven the original statement. As the original statement sometimes originated from supposedly wise men and men of authority, 
This had put Socrates in a socially precarious position, but Socrates believed that his method of pursuing the truth, and more generally speaking, philosophy, literally the love of wisdom, was the most important purpose to which he could dedicate his life. Having been found guilty, accounts of the trial differ with regards to what transpired at sentencing, but it's generally agreed that he chose death over being forbidden to continue his quest for truth, i.e. examining life. Indeed, when he is visited in prison by his friends Crito in, in the days between his sentencing and his execution, who explains that he and other friends and supporters would like to bribe the guards for Socrates' freedom, Socrates argues that one's goal ought to be to live a just and virtuous life rather than a long one. In spite of the challenges of verifying the accuracy of this record of events, it would appear to be a testament to one man holding fast to his values and priorities. Death comes up in a slogan or credo which appears in both the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Virtus Jungsit, mors non separabit. What virtue has joined, let death not put asunder. This can be applied in a few somewhat different contexts, but is generally taken to represent our wish that what the force of good has united through the actions of Freemasonry should outlast death. Is this naive optimism? I think we will acknowledge that death separates us from our friends and loved ones, apart from the extent to which we may feel comfort from speaking with them, even beyond those events. But I also think it is reasonable to say that from one perspective, that which Masonry sets in motion truly does outlast death. Summarized aptly by the quote from sometimes lauded and sometimes reviled Masonic author Albert Pike, who said, what we do for ourselves dies with us. What we do for others and the world remains and is immortal. Freemasonry attempts to teach us, among several tenets, to extend charity, not just of material means, but charity of spirit, toward our brother, and gradually to extend that charity to all humankind. If we can live up to this, then surely its impact, the, echo, the echoes, domino effect, or what have you, will indeed outlast our own lifetime. Of course, there is without question a risk that our contemplation of mortality, instead of leading us down a path of reasoning that inspires us to take what time we have and make the most of it, could take a dark and morbid turn. If we are convinced that the fleeting and unpredictable nature of human life makes our labors futile, it's hard to maintain hope in the face of that conclusion. This sentiment is captured nicely by an old English word, dust shavung, which we find in the collected poems, the Blickling Homilies, dating back to the 10th century, meaning reflection upon former civilizations or peoples, or the knowledge that all things will become dust. An example we may be more familiar with comes from the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley. I met a traveler from an ancient land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Reference to this piece has practically become shorthand in our culture for the hubris of believing that one's accomplishments will last forever and broadcast one's greatness to future generations. But indeed, how can we not harbor such aspirations? Surely even good, decent folks entertain some small hope that they won't disappear into obscurity when they pass on. Perhaps there is a clue in the aforementioned quote from Pike. Perhaps our motivation, our intention, differentiates between whether this hope stands a chance or is in vain. Since we tend to rely on our operative builders metaphor, consider the architects and builders of cathedrals who were typically unlikely to see the finished product of what they had begun or were contributing to in their own lifetime. Both Cologne Cathedral in Germany and St. Vitus's Cathedral in Prague took about 600 years to complete, potentially 20 or more generations at the time. A concurring sentiment is captured in another quote. Nelson Henderson, 
a pioneer who settled in Ontario, Canada, said to his grandson Wesley on his graduation day, the true meaning of life, Wesley, is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. The speaker's great-great-grandson went on to clarify in an interview with the blogger Guy Horst in 2019 that the quote was probably paraphrasing the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, who died in 1941, who once said, the one who plants trees knowing that he will never sit in their shade has at least started to understand the meaning of life. This is the challenge that we face. We have entered the chamber and been confronted with our own mortality. And it is possible that, as with initiation, some great transformation awaits us when we emerge. It is possible that our next step takes us to the threshold of a new way of living, but our weight here in the chamber of reflection has grown to feel like an interminable purgatory, with no way of knowing how long we have left to go. Thankfully, one flaw in this analogy is that we are not in the chamber alone. Even as we try to maintain some safe social distance, at least we know that we are all undergoing this trial together. If we bear this in mind, that even in these strange and isolating times, we are truly not alone, then hopefully we can support each other th even through this test, sharing our hopes and fears around what has already passed and what lies ahead until we emerge from interiora terre into the light of a new day. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Brother Austin. Any uh, any questions or comments uh, for our speaker? That either oh, means that I fleshed the concepts out in their totality and no questions remain, or I have lulled everyone into a peaceful sleep. Yes, either way of some benefit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's because we're all muted right now. So, uh, no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I, I look forward to going through it again because there was just so much wonderful information there and I, I look forward to sharing that with people yeah mm -hmm. it, it was a lot i mean i admit it was a lot to take in so i was following it but yeah it was sort of like oh wow and then you're on to the next topic and it is different than the reflection that they have in commandery right so um my my familiarity with implementing the chamber itself is a little bit limited in that we don't currently have it as a practice in Blue Lodge in Pennsylvania either. Um, but I will say that I, I benefited quite a bit by reaching out to this, father, uh, this uh, brother, Bob Painter. Um, it was something of a coincidence, but it so happened that uh, he was making a presentation to this uh, academic society that they've created in Ohio about uh, how they implemented the Chamber of Reflection in his Blue Lodge in the state of Ohio where it is permitted. And he, uh, he also laid out some specifics, you know, that they identified a room in the building that could be used, uh, what they did with the room, how they decorated it, uh, the way that they changed the setup slightly for the first degree versus the third. Um, so what I can do, if you wish, after, uh, after our presentation today is done, is share the information that I got from Brother Bob Painter, either with interested individuals from the audience or I could pass it to uh, Brother Chris, and he could share it out to folks. You're well. welcome. Just post post it in the Facebook group. I think that's the easiest way to get it out to people. Ah, okay. That's, I'll that just, way, I, what it's I'm gonna there. Do is just you don't have to, to go through me. It's you just put it out there when you have it together. <laughs> right. There's no sense in me making more work for you. I exactly. exactly. Um, See, someone but what, I, what I will do is <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a brief respite to reach out to Brother Bob and confirm I've got his permission to disseminate it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't foresee him having a problem with it. I think if we, you know, add an explicit caveat that this is what's acceptable in the state of Ohio and confirm with your own Grand Lodge before proceeding willy nilly, uh, I think it will probably be okay. So that, yeah, so, you know, our, I was just going to say, our, our blue book it tells us exactly when to do it, where to do it, how the room must be set up, all, all that, all that good stuff. I was just curious as to historically when it kind of started appearing as part of the oh. they're really not part of the ritual it's separate from the ritual but part of the tradition of blue lodge and when it appeared as part of tradition for commandry yeah at the risk of sounding like i'm uh, gonna hand everything off to brother bob um he mentions a, a bit of historical background and context in his presentation as well 
So that'll be included when you have your hands on it. I, I know that I, I leaned pretty heavily into the symbolic side of this and its, and its uh, associations with symbolism elsewhere, um, rather than necessarily being a practical nuts and bolts presentation. Um, but I do have some of that information secondhand that I can also share with you. I, I do want to comment, Austin, that it's my understanding in hearing about that this is something you typically do for an entered apprentice. So his first time entering the lodge, he goes through this experience. Do you say that Ohio has different, they, they basically do it for each degree and it's slightly different for each degree? Even more interestingly, uh, this particular lodge in Ohio that I'm referencing currently does it for the first and third and not the second. But, interesting. That, curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> I, I think there's much more. I mean, if, if you look objectively at the three degrees, um, the first two have more in common than the first does with the last, I would think. But I mean, you, you gotta, if you look closely, you can probably find some connection where, you know, the fellow craft is more like the master masons in this regard and so on. But I mean, generally the EA and the fellow craft are very similar. And in a very, in, in the terms master of masons very, is set aside, but you yeah. Know. In terms of a very, just a personal and subjective opinion, like just, just exclusively my own take on it. Um, it strikes me as potentially being most appropriate to do it before the first and, and only then, like only once. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. If, if anything else, I could also see it being done exclusively before the third, although my, m like my intuition and preference would be that it be exclusively once before the first. Right. Um, but if you want to ask a guy to contemplate these concepts before each stage of initiation, that might also have its merits. And I could even see the value or merit in asking him to focus on different specific aspects or nuances at each stage. Right. So this may be yet another one of those things that ends up taking on interesting branches, variations, and mutations as it, uh, as it gets pursued in different jurisdictions. Um, it, it, because innovation is not entirely non-existent in Freemasonry, but quite rare, uh, this could be uh, the, the dawning of an interesting new era. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say it, it's, I recently wrote a paper uh, for the Scottish Rite on the 25th degree, which is the, uh, the Night of the Brazen Serpent. And it is the, the, um, the Islamic degree. It delves into Islam. Uh, specifically, and it's something that it's a degree that, in most my experience, there are a lot of degrees. The higher degree that between, say, the 18th and the 30th, that most Scottish Rite valleys don't, uh, I'll say, it, don't bother to confer because most Scottish Rite valleys are not in a position to confer all 29 degrees. They have the five, five obligatory ones in the southern jurisdiction, which is the fourth. 14th, 18th, and 30th, and 32nd, which is to say the first one and the last one in all four bodies. So yep. it's an easy way if you don't, if you want to tell apart which body has which degrees, you just look at which are the obligatory ones. But what is interesting is one of many things I took out of it. I had a lot of fun writing it. Um, I read in Bridge to Light, which is Albert Pike's interpretation of basically his commentary on all of the degrees that he rewrote. And the Albert Pike version of the degrees are what the Scottish Rite did for over 100 years. In 2004, they revamped them. So the degrees I received back in 95 are different than the ones we're conferring today. The ones that I know because I take part in them are all the ones from 2004 onward. So I don't really remember the differences, but we have brothers my age who were active in Scottish Rite all along, whereas I kind of took time away and came back. But the point is, I read A Bridge to Light and I read the current script, and most of what I wrote about came from the current script. But it all takes place currently in one tent. You enter a room and there's five Sufis, Sufi masters, sitting on pillows in this tent in the desert. The original degree and it's talked about in bridge to light there are five different apartments four four different apartments and in each one so different rooms the candidate walks into a room alone sits there 
and in some cases is made to write something and he sits for five minutes in silence or is made to write out something, answer some questions, and then he goes to the next apartment and then the next and the next. And only in the fourth apartment does he actually interact with the cast. The newer version that we all know only has the fourth apartment, so there's only one. But right. that reminds me a lot of the Chamber of Reflection in that you're made to sit and f- answer questions as a candidate Whereas most Masonic degrees are passive. You sit, you sit in a room and someone confers the degree in front of you and you're supposed to watch. And if you're the um, if you're the uh, um, the I forget the word, if you're the guy from the cast who gets to take part in the degree, I forget what the title is, but there's one guy, the proxy for the class, proxy, gets to actually walk through the degrees and say a couple of words, you know, I do, I do here and there. Your so, exemplar. You're, you're the exemplar, thank you. The exemplar takes part. Most of the rest of the cast sits and watches of the class. So my point is, it's that was a time when we were much more interactive, where the candidates actually had to do something. Just for those of you who are not in Scottish Rite, a big distinction between the Scottish Rite and the craft degrees, you have an obligation and you have to memorize the catechism to go from an apprentice to fellow craft and then to master mason. In the Scottish Rite, as in the Royal Arch, you just go and get the degrees at the time they schedule them. You don't, they're not waiting on you to do something before you move on. You can get all the degrees over the course of a weekend in the case of Scottish Rite. Elsewhere in the world, and Brian can attest to this because I think he's a couple degrees behind me, and he may never get to the 32nd um, right. in England and elsewhere. You stop around what, the, the 30th or the? Um, well, you, go, you, you come in on the 18th. Okay. And, and the next is the, the 30th. And you wait a while uh, main, for the thirtieth. Yeah, okay. you could depending on the size of the lodge. It's by progression. You could wait sort of 20, 25 years. Exactly. So, so in the, the the joke is, you know, in in America, it's like you're a thirty second degree Scottish Rite Mason. Yes, my check cleared. So you know, that's <laughs> that's okay. it. I mean, literally, oh you get all the degrees in one go. So, like, my my point is. You don't have the the candidate does not have to actively take part other than sitting in a room and watching the degrees. Mm. And something that is what I like about the idea of the chamber of reflection is you have to take you're taking more, you're participating more in your initiation than simply it's being conferred upon you. And I like that so idea about it. If I can if uh, thank you, and if I can just springboard off of that and just Please. bring even more of a lightning rod of controversy to your to your nice little yes, presentation yes. series. Yes, um, I can always edit this out. It's okay. Yeah, this, this, will, <laughs> this will be the super secret degree. Um, so one of the things that I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, b- moving back and forth between Blue Lodge and York Rite and Scottish Rite is the way that the experiences are similar or different in terms of the uh, initiation rituals and how much of it is uh, where the candidate is behaving like an audience versus uh, the de- the rituals and degrees in, in these various bodies, which are more participatory. And I think that's part of what you were pointing to. Yes. And so I think part of the uh, interest and appeal right now about the Chamber of Reflection is that it is adding an experience to uh, a fellow's initiation that is more participatory. And we know that that's something that can lend to more engagement when when a fellow has more of a personal role in in right. his experience more skin right? in the game now agreed now one of the things that you brought up is how some of these Scottish right degrees are not performed by every valley everywhere in the u.s or or, or where have you um partly because of practical limitations that they face so if they don't if they lack the sets and costumes or lack enough participation by members and officers to 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 perform in the cast as it were right you become limited in which experiences you're able to offer to the incoming candidates in those scottish right classes and so one of the things that is uh, part of like a, a single essay that i wrote which is one of the the few that really uh, stirred and riled people up was the notion of someday making use of vr as an immersive experience uh, wow. to be part of candidates initiation Oh, you're breaking because up Austin. the idea of some you know in a in an auditorium 
uh, versus being more of a you know first person shooter, like a person being in, involved in the action. Not to mention, of course, the uh, the level to which you could change uh, the way that the the physical environment surrounding that candidate might appear, or the appearance of the other uh, uh, entities that he's interacting with in that space might appear. You have this tool that creates the opportunity to create a, a really radically different immersive experience. And I am not advocating for it right now. I understand that there would be the general concerns of secrecy and security as to whether it's something that could be accomplished. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if Freemasonry 100 years from now looks a bit different than it does today. And if it one day incorporates some component of VR in the experience, because it would uh, obliterate those limitations in terms of what kind of immersive experience could you create for an initiatic candidate and what kind of emotional impact might it have on him. So let me just throw that out there to, yeah. to you know, the golden <laughs> apple of Eris to cause some, some real, uh, real scrabbling. Um, but I, that's just me trying to make a, a, a futuristic prediction. Uh, I imagine that's something that could be on the horizon someday. Well, I'll say this. And you want to talk about VR now? Go ahead. <laughs> if, you, if you have a comment, go ahead. Well, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole. I, w I wasn't sure if you was opening that up to a conversation or if we're getting <laughs> off track there. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a little off track, but we're not. I mean, it's only 11. I mean, if you want to discuss it a little bit, I won't, I won't stop you, but... Yeah, I, I guess my only thoughts, and it's it's not specific to VR, but I think it goes just towards uh, candid experience and quality of ritual work in general. So I think like a, a VR experience could definitely bring a lot of value to the candidate. What my concern would be, what is the impact then on uh, the expectations of preparation of the other members? So I think one problem that we see in masonry right now uh, is that the quality of work that we're giving candidates is not all it could be. And we're creating an environment where people are, are their candidates are seeing us setting the expectation up front based on the quality of work that we're providing. And so if you go to a, something like a VR, yes, that first experience might be good, but if the, the brothers then don't know the ritual themselves because they're actually not performing it, preparing it, don't know the work. What does that create downstream? Like, are we creating more problems through solutions? I guess is my initial thought. Good, good a, point. A very valid concern. I will say this, Austin. Oh, by the way, Brother Whitfield posted in the chat, if you want to look about the Houston Scottish Rite, does have some sort of a VR setup. Um, but I wanted to share this because um, I'll put this as delicately as I can. Uh, I'm a member of the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. And in America, we have the northern Masonic jurisdiction who we recently had a study group where we're, 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 we're taking a study group where we're learning about the 33rd degree. It's a very short um, um, study guide. It's basically a correspondence course that the Scottish Rite offers. Uh, it's called Y33. It's all about the history of the origins of the Scottish Rite and why there are 33 degrees and all that. It's interesting. But they, they explain why there's a northern Masonic jurisdiction. So basically, that's 15 states north of the Mason-Dixon and east of the Mississippi, if I have it correctly. But in the northern Masonic jurisdiction, they now have videos. They've made videos of all of their degrees, which the candidates sit and watch. Yeah, not, now, not quite all of them. Uh, not quite well, all of them, but, okay. but a nice, we're, getting, we're getting along to a nice chunk. Okay, yes. well, I, I, um, I will say just my initial take on it. On the plus side, it's an opportunity to actually see all 29 degrees because once they're finished, any of us could go and sit down and watch all of the degrees that we've never seen performed in person. But to me, on the negative, and it's a very, it's a very heavy negative to me, is part of what masonry, what makes masonry special and what makes it work is the ability as individuals to be involved and participating in initiating new members. 
I get most satisfaction out of the Scottish Rite in being a degree master and participating in degrees and writing papers about the degrees, which is what I'm currently spending more time doing. So the idea that by the Valley going and buying a set of DVDs from the Supreme Council and the candidates just sit in a room and they just play it on a projector for everybody to watch or worse here, brother Austin, we just, you just, we just cast your check for Scottish, right? Take these videos home and watch them in the privacy of your own, your own house. If we diminish the degrees to the point that they're just another movie, another entertainment thing where it's solo and you're just watching the video, I think that greatly, greatly diminishes the impact on the candidate. I think he loses something fundamentally. And more importantly, all of the members of the Valley who we are always trying to find, you know, we keep saying over and over again, how do we get new members interested? How do we get new members to, to be involved? Give them a job. If I put you on a degree team, you work together with that cast, you practice together, you bond together as, uh, as, as a unit, and you confer that degree, and you have good memories of getting together and practicing the degree and doing a good job, and you learn more. Believe me, you learn much more about a degree when you're a member of the cast, especially if you're a degree master, and you read the script over and over again and think, how do I change the blocking? Where do I put this person, moves in front of this person? Can I rearrange the room? And so on. You actually understand the degree and what it teaches because you've read the script over and over again. If I free you from doing any of that as a member and you just watch the videos once and you're like, okay, I'm done. I watched them. It's, it's over with. It's like, it's like government training. You know, you, you sat through the counterintelligence class one more time and it, it don't mean anything to you. So I don't know. To me, I, I think that's a big, that's a move in the wrong direction because it's taking it away from what masonry is and trying to make it like the rest of the world and things. We can do visual education. We can, you can watch a streaming video at, in your house and get all of your training that way. Well, that's how governments and businesses do training, but that's not how masonry should be educated. I don't well, know. I, to I me, it's say, a big thing. That's just me. Yeah, I, I can't say I that I came out. Uh, I can't say that I came out chiefly to uh, be an apologist or make a defense, launch a defense of the Northern Masonic jurisdiction. Um, <laughs> But I think in the context of what you were saying earlier about how um, you can see where the delivery of degrees changes uh, under some circumstances over time based on what's practically, practically possible and can be achieved uh, by different specific bodies of men and what they've got, the, the resources they've got available to them. Um, I think that there are, there are reasons it should be avoided and then there are also reasons that it sometimes becomes necessary. Um, I don't know whether we are going to lose anybody logging off, just given the time the time frame uh, that we're that we're in right now. So I just, at the risk of sounding like I'm shamelessly plugging myself, uh, I Please, wanted plug. to point out two things that I have shared in the chat. Um, I, uh, if if you enjoyed and were interested in today's presentation, um, I have a book that I published uh, about a year ago or so uh, that contains. Uh, two, two pieces of basic source material. Um, it's a collection of 15 articles that I published for our Scottish Rite magazine, uh, as well as the text of a presentation that I gave to the Squirrel Hill Historical Society. Um, if you want to stay in touch with me in terms of what other speaking engagements I've got, I've got, I've got maybe another six lined up over the course of this year, and I just booked my first speaking engagement for 2024. I'm very excited. Awesome. Uh, you can follow my uh, shenanigans and exploits uh, on Facebook. I have a separate author page. So that's the first link that I posted in the chat here at 1101 is to my Facebook author page. Uh, then right below uh, Jim Whitfield's uh, uh, link about the Freemasons for Dummies uh, blog, um, you will also see a link that should take you to the Amazon page for my book if anybody is interested in that. So at the risk of, of, of taking the topic in a completely separate direction, uh, no, I did want to share that info with people in case they were interested before anybody yeah. needs to run off. You're welcome to plug your book. Well, I, I often joke that uh, Brian is my, my Ed McMahon, a lovely co-host <laughs> here. And so if, I, if I'm Johnny Carson, then I expect my guests to plug their book. So it's quite all right. 
<laughs> Thank you kindly. And, and and the fact that we are at a point where some people in this chat don't even know who Johnny Carson or Ed McMahon is <laughs> makes Hi-oh. me weep. <laughs> uh, Michael, you had a comment? Yeah, it's just uh, two things. I, I agree with you uh, from being in the Scottish Rite and also being a degree master here for Richmond, but that I've really missed doing the live degrees because first it was COVID and now we've sold our temple here in Richmond. So right. we're meeting with, in the Shrine Temple. I truly miss being, you know, part of the being master of the one degree and then also that I participated in the 30th degree, uh, which has a lot to do with what we're talking about. It has its own sort of like similar to Chamber of Reflection section, the 30th, you know, if you think about it, the with the, you know, the spirit uh, and et cetera. But uh, the, the second thing I wanted to point out about that is that um, I'm seeing uh, more and more monitors, you know, the widescreen monitors going up in Lodge. On that level, I think it's actually enhanced some of the Lodges that I've been to that have had that, you know, for one thing during the lectures, you know, that it's, you know, it's a second, it's, it's an improvement on the, you know, the classic, uh, A, I'm going to pass around some pictures or B, you know, uh, I'm going to, you know, do the, um, you know, doing the c- c- computer PowerPoint oh, and, stuff. And, and just to be clear, I'm on it now. Mm-hmm. I offered to Brother Austin, if he had a presentation, we can show it here. It's much yeah. easier to do here because we're all looking at the screen anyway. Mm-hmm. I am all in favor of a lodge having a monitor and mm-hmm. doing a PowerPoint presentation, picture, what have you. That enhances it, but that's for enhancing a exactly. given presentation. And if some lodges have moved to, instead of doing the old uh, magic lantern bit of, you know, the old slide projectors for during the degrees, if they put it up on a screen, that's a totally different thing. Using yeah. technology to enhance what we're doing, I'm all in favor of. But this would be like, I, I, I'm opposed to the idea of replacing degrees altogether with with a video that you can buy of. I think we're going to show uh, some of the videos here at our next reunion. So I'm going to sit in on that. Aside from mm-hmm. the fact that I'm hoping to bring a couple of candidates in just to see how, how that works because it'll be the first time I've seen it. And thirdly, mm-hmm. I, of course, the, I guess everybody always hears the story. And I'm not sure if there's Southern or Northern jurisdiction, but Guthrie, Oklahoma supposedly is one of the few places in the country that takes three days and actually performs every one of the degrees. Yes. Before. And to one day I, I want to go see that. Yeah. Um, I do, before we lose, we, we had a high watermark of 30 people here in attendance, which is pretty good. I'll know later on if that was, we actually, I, I, I get I get the stats when I bother to go in and pull them down from you, from uh, Zoom. And, and, and I, I save the metrics so I know how many people we have, but it tells me how many unique sign-ins we have. So we may have had as many as 35 unique sign-ins because I think people came and went. But since we still have... 21 people here. I'm going to go ahead and do the promo uh, for the next time. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Brother Austin. Uh, We really enjoyed that presentation and the discussion. Um, If you're watching us on YouTube sometime in the... I'm a a time traveler. If you're watching me in the future on YouTube, please like and subscribe. That helps us out. Our next um, event is going to be on Saturday, March 18th. And Right Worshipful John Meek, who lives in Bulgaria, is going to be our guest speaker. He'll be speaking of interjurisdictional masonry, um, which has to do with visitation between different jurisdictions, between different Grand Lodges. The next one after that will be Brother Vincent Cardin on um, April 1st. He will be speaking on uh, Masonic Brotherhood in the Face of War. He'll be speaking about um, brothers in brother masons during the American Civil War and acts of brotherhood. So two more interesting talks coming up. Um, I think that's about all I have with us. We just had our our last stated. Uh, the next in person stated for Virginia Research will be in May, and I'll I'll promote that as we come close for those of you who are close enough to come in person. Um, any brother have any other comments before we break? I just had a question. How did, how, how, since I was unable to attend last week because of a funeral that I went to, yes. how, how was attendance and uh, how did it go, go up a little bit? Or I was think it? we had um, 16 in attendance and there were at least three brothers who were from Richmond Lodges who hadn't been there before, I think. so. We'd have three more if it weren't for the funeral. <laughs> right. Well, yes, and, and something can't be uh, 
can't be prevented. But we did have, uh, I think, eight or ten of us went to lunch at Roma's afterwards. So that was well received. But we, we wouldn't be able to continue if we didn't have all of you coming in from all over the country and across the pond. And even from Australia, Brother Graham, joining us. I mean, it's a good thing that bars close early, so he comes home and, and signs in. We appreciate it. <laughs> really, really. It's around two, what, three in the morning now? Ah, uh, three in the morning. Oh, good lord! Good for you. Three, well, three in the morning. Uh, I'll, I'll make Graham, it. I cannot morning. thank you enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other brother? Any uh, any comments? Anyone who joined late, if they want to say hello, brother Franco, you're a frequent flyer. Good to with us again. Um, well, thank you. I really, really enjoyed this, um, and I'm glad you're on YouTube because, for instance, the next your next two meetings, I have other conflicting obligations. I understand. Daylight well, Lodge that I was master of three years, and a uh, other things. But uh, just a comment on, um, <clears throat> of course, the well first. First, the Chamber of Reflection in Massachusetts. Of course, it's only used in uh, commandery, but uh, in, in a lot of, uh, like in Ger one of the German Grand Lodges, there's a skeleton involved hmm. in their degrees, which we don't do here. Uh, Odd Fellows also does that. And I think in masonry, you know, we say in the first degree, it's the internal and not the external that recommends a man to be made a mason. And, and the chamber of reflection should also be the, that internal, the skull, so forth. That's that's looking inside what it means for our mortality, not, you know, some some Halloween joke. <laughs> that's right. right. And I do believe that is the concern that our Grand Lodge has is of having the symbol of the I had, of course, the picture of the, the skull from, you know, you just Google. Um, you just uh, um, Google Chamber of Reflection and you can find a whole bunch of images that lodges have posted online. That's what I used for our our intro there uh, for the event. But so. also on a, a comment on um, the northern Masonic jurisdiction and the videos, um, the uh, video degrees. Uh, yes, we're great during COVID. Thursday night at the right has been strong, um, but what was said here is true. I mean, it's a fraternity, and getting to know your brothers is working on the degrees, being in the cast. That's where you really make the strong bonds and ties. You know, the rehearsals, the so on, working together. That yes. Makes Eternity, just watching degrees. Now. On the other hand, is uh, current commander in chief of consistory getting a cast together currently is like pulling hens teeth. Yes, it is. I, I will say what I've done, Raymond, is is I've been a degree master for the thirty second degree for oh lord eleven years now, I think. Um, and I just about have two people for each part, which was my goal to get at least two deep in all the roles, which is, it's hard to just get one man consistently in each part and every reunion, it seems like scrambling because someone can't be there. But I took a page from the shrine and their idea of units. If you know, if you're familiar with the shrine, if you join the shrine and that's all you do, you're going to be bored and you're going to wonder where you join. You join the shrine to belong to one or more units. And the units are, they drive the mini Model Ts or the mini 18-wheelers or the motorcycles or the clowns, what have you. But it's the units, they have their own presidents, they have their own dues, they meet on their own. And it's about 10, maybe 15 members. And the units together have social meetings. They have their own, you know, president, what have you. They have their own thing and they get together as a group you have tighter cohesion within the units than you would with the shrine as a whole so trying to draw from that and i've encouraged the other degree masters in our valley i've had a dinner at least once a year where all the members of our cast of the 32nd degree get together and we go out to eat because if we can start doing social things together and we meet each other outside of our ritual practices it's a way of building of building that bond of we're coming together and we're a team 
in this cast. And if we do social things together, um, you know, we're going to get to know each other a little bit better and, and become a better team. And I think that's something every degree team should do. And then they, that will only encourage people to stay active. And it's not just something they're doing at the reunion, but they feel connected to the members of their cast and they want to participate and they want to be active. So that's just my take. And it, it's, it's true. But on the other hand, um, I'm secretary of the Valley of Greenfield. Uh, our average age, mid age is like 71. So. Mm. <laughs> My, uh, that, that's 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 part of the problem is, is just the manpower. I understand that totally. <laughs> I totally understand that. Um, let's see, uh, brother uh, Austin, if you would please uh, put your links on our Facebook group too, so people can see them. Because yes, I can. Okay. Uh, one one quick question, please. Uh, yep. So I'm going to encourage some some of the some of the brothers in this area to to start joining these talks. Pretty interesting. Um, on the, I found it through Facebook and I think the invite said like 10 AM to 1 PM. What is the normal length of these? Um, I don't, I normally don't have a closing time. Um, generally they last an hour and I, I would say an hour and a half is pretty typical. Perfect. Um, I've had some go till 12, but, um, other people, you know, people start dropping off. We've already, you know, we had 30 people here and shortly after the talk, people started dropping off, but they're at least an hour. And again, this is something, Andy, where I haven't, uh, I've talked about this a few times in the chat here and with other people. I don't have, I haven't gone back and done the research and looked at the metrics, looked at all of our previous ones and counted how long the actual talk is and then how long the actual video is. I do need to do that and get a feel for like, Austin asked me, should it be 20 minutes or 30 minutes? I don't have a good answer yet because I'm still figuring this out after three years of doing this part time. Um, <laughs> so I need to get a handle on it. I, ideally, we should probably get it down to around an hour. And then what goes on YouTube is around an hour video. But we're kind of relaxed. I'm not really strict on people commenting. And I don't have a lot of time to edit it. So generally, I kind of clip off the beginning and the end and post bulk of it online. But I owe it to everybody to go in and take out just the talk and some of the questions and make a shorter, leaner video on YouTube. So we're not really strict on how long people can talk. I've had some talks go for almost an hour with just the speaker. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's still yeah. kind of, I don't have a firm answer of how long. I will tell you from experience, 1130 to 12, somewhere in there okay. generally. That but, sounds good. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate that. And please promote us as much as as you can. For sure. Well, I've been on a few of these now, and uh, they're generally uh, around about an hour and a half. That's that's my experience. Yeah. So what I you, what I usually do when I do a, a lecture, sir, is I usually try to keep it to about twenty to thirty minutes, right. and then I leave it to opening questions or anything like that because. Uh, I'm an instructor. I used to be an instructor at the uh, U.S. Army Chemical School. And what we find out is that the tension span is just, especially during these times, um, the tension span goes out probably around 40 to 50 minutes. And we usually put yes. students on a 10 minute break and then come back. So mm -hmm. what I usually do is I, when I'm doing a Masonic lecture, I will usually hold it to, I usually do about 20 to 30 minutes. And then I leave it because it, it I hit that like those key points, and I go in, and then we then I it, I think it leaves the audience a little bit more apt to wanting to have a more discussion because it's still kind of fresh in their minds. What if it's more of an extension? It, it probably like you know you you I think you might begin to lose some. Agreed. Plus, as a little bit older, I, I can't speak for everybody in the in the room because we got some very young guys in here. <laughs> um, Talk about you and me, my uh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, um, Chris Michael uh, said there um, he does Masonic lectures. Perhaps you should you two should be together. Yes. Yeah. So, oh, we we talked. Uh, us. Okay. Yes. Uh, I I have a I'm working on about three right now. Um, when you're ready. Please. <laughs> okay, sir. No problem. But uh, yes, that's what I usually do, sir. 
That is one I, will, I will say this, and I think you're on point. We talked about TED Talks in the last one. Uh, Brother Doherty talked about that. And they found in the TED Talks that you're supposed to talk for no more than 18 minutes, and they limit you to that. I think if I'm given a talk in a lodge, it should be 10 to 15 minutes. I've talked for 20 minutes in a lodge before, and I can see you start to lose people. I think I have more leeway here because we're all seated. We're all drinking, most of us. Um, you know, we're able to relax and kind of, you know, it's a little more relaxed atmosphere than in a yeah. lodge room. So you could probably go 30 minutes. But like I said, I need to go back and, and capture the metrics of not just the length of the video, but find the beginning, actually the talk itself. And I'm willing to bet if I wanted to edit them down, I could probably cut some gaps. We had times where the speaker loses his place where he gets the wrong, you know, he, he gets out of place on the PowerPoint. And again, if I if I was a good editor, and I probably could be if I took the time, if I sat there with the video and edited it, I could probably tighten it up better. But mm. um, I do want to start doing that and see what we come up with and see if maybe that gets more of a response um, from the YouTube video, the YouTube viewers. Anyway, if you're watching us on YouTube, please like and subscribe. I want to say that again. <laughs> I need to go and wrap this up, brother. It's 1130. Thank you all for participating. Hope to see you in a couple of weeks. And please tell your friends um, to join us uh, at our next YouTube meeting. Thank you Thanks very much. See you next time.